Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator of the session, Rachel Rizzo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I think everyone can hear me. Um, welcome to day two of GlobeSec. It's an honor to be with everyone today. Um, I can see our speakers up here calling in from Zoom, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today, this afternoon, we are talking about the intersection of climate and security. If you've paid attention to many of the agendas at multilateral institutions, at many defense departments around the world, the increasing intersection between climate and national security um, and international cooperation is becoming ever more apparent. And so today we have a fantastic panel to discuss just that. First, I'd like to go ahead and present Kate Guy, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security in Washington, DC. Welcome. Up on the screen there, we have jo uh, Janani Vivekananda, who is the head of the climate and diplomacy, or the uh, the head of the climate diplomacy and security program at Adelphi in Berlin. Hi, Janani, good to see you. Uh, we have Hi, Alexander Rachel. Verbeek, who is the um, policy director, um, the Environment and Development Resource Center in Brussels. Nice to see you, Alexander. And we have Brian Moran, who's vice president of global sustainability and policy and partnership at Boeing. Brian, it's nice to see you as well. So let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Alexander, I'm going to go ahead and turn it right to you because we just had a very important meeting last weekend of G7 leaders in Cornwall. And I noticed that you wrote something and you mentioned that you were disappointed in a way in the climate outcomes of that particular meeting. Can you expand on that a little bit and to tell us what would you have what you would have liked to see, especially in terms of the intersection of climate and security at the G7? Yes, I think the essence of what I wrote is that G7 ended up with lots of, of good intentions. Um, things you can't disagree with, uh, speaking about moving towards a green economy and, and help poorer countries and uh, those kind of good intention, intentions. I, I only miss the, the thoughts and prayers. But what you really need is very clear time frames of, of phasing out fossil fuels and, and, uh, and the financing to, to back all okay. these ambitions. So what, what they have now is a commitment to end uh, the financing of um, overseas investment of coal. But if you listen to the International Energy Agency, and that is not um, some kind of, of activistic um, uh, green organization, this used to be until very recently the darling of the fossil fuel industry. They say we should end all investments in all fossil fuel projects, not only coal. So it's, um, it's too little. And too late and and we need much higher ambitions and and treat um, this emergency as an emergency and not as some kind of new policy we should work on in the years to come absolutely um, I'm gonna ask Kate to expand on that but before I do I realized that at the beginning I forgot to let everyone know that we are using Slido for questions so if you have questions that you'd like to, to ask the panelists um, you can either do that at the, at the microphone when we get to the Q&A section or ask on Slido. So I wanted to make sure we had that uh, point of order before we go ahead and dive in. Um, Kate, coming to you, will you expand a little bit on what Alexander uh, w was saying about, about this meeting? And um, to expand it a little bit, I mean, the role of multinational institutions like the EU, like NATO, when it comes to when it comes to climate and, and, and international security, I mean, there's obviously a role there. Mm -hmm. What is it, and how can international or, or different countries that might have different approaches to climate, different goals, how does that sort of manifest itself in these multinational institutions? Yeah, so it's it's a great segue from what Alexander was just saying because he was speaking about the urgent need to mitigate, to make stronger commitments, to do something about the climate problem, and unfortunately, we've sort 
sort of left it go so far that now the doing something is increasingly security actors having to do something about the problem because we're seeing more and more climate destabilization lead to the destabilization of local uh, environments and places with histories and legacies of conflict around the world. And unfortunately, the, the longer we wait to do something about the climate problem, the worse we know these futures become. Uh, there's increasingly incredible uh, analysis done by, by groups like mine, the Center for Climate and Security, Adelphi with uh, John and, e and others around the world looking at how bad things get, even at just uh, a half a degree more of warming, the security consequences of that are, are sort of out of control, let alone the trajectory that we're on. So the exciting thing, I guess, is that you have increasingly Ministry of Defense, political leaders, and uh, uh, like the alliance um, uh, earlier this week, understanding that these are security problems that need to be central to security strategies. That is quite new, right? Uh, we've been sort of banging on about the, the security climate intersection for quite a while now. Only within the last uh, year or two, past few months, I think, are political leaders waking up and realizing this is not just a side issue for discussion in uh, the UNFCCC, in, in the COP process. This is actually a central security tenant. Uh, so you have, you've seen the Biden administration saying this will be central to our national security and defense strategy. NATO's commitment and action plan earlier this week is huge in terms of pledging investment and, and cooperation, a new center for excellence in Canada. Uh, these are sort of hot off the press commitments, but they're actually uh, sort of revolutionary in thinking about the problem multinationally. Thank you. Johnny, I'd like to turn to you to to expand a, a little bit on, on, on what, what Kate was saying. I mean, you've done a lot of work on this. In terms of how you're thinking about multinational institutions, could you um, expand a little bit on her comments, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, absolutely, Kate. Uh, uh, Rachel, I think... Um, I'd, I'd agree with what what Kate's set out, and I think also there's 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 something like a symbolic significance as well with multilateral institutions and entities like NATO um, making such statements. People might not be satisfied <clears throat> with the, the the meat of what the G7s come out with, or be um, frustrated that there's no kind of timeline or an, an endpoint or nothing specifically measurable in the NATO climate action plan that was launched uh, on Monday, climate security action plan that was launched on Monday. But I think there's a real um, symbolic significance of uh, institutions like NATO, like the EU, like the G7, um, making climate change, but also climate change and security uh, central to um, to their agendas at the moment. But also on a more practical level, I think there's there's a value in what they are doing. Whilst they're not kind of at that point where the, the rubber can hit the road and they can get down to operations, there is, um, I think, quite substantive action in at the strategic level where there's there are efforts to integrate climate security considerations into strategic planning. Uh, if you look at the EU's roadmap, um, its climate change and defense roadmap that it launched last year, it specifically looks to integrate climate change into all defense actions across the EU by increasing its understanding of security implications of climate change. Uh, increasing its understanding of how climate change affects its missions um, now and in the future, and then in, in uh, addressing a better understanding and then addressing um, the infrastructure side of things, how it has to improve infrastructure to effectively carry out sustainable missions. So, you know, they're building it in that, that knowledge into str strategy, and then you, you need that knowledge before you can get down to operations. Yes, we do also be, uh, need to be acting at the operational level, but um, I think the strategic um, piece is is really um, something to be uh, lauded as well, and we see that in the in the NATO declaration, in the NATO um, action plan as well. But then also, if you look at uh, institutions like the, the UN system, they're also quite um, substantive steps taken there. Not you know not as far as we want it to be, but uh, the the UN just a few years ago, about three years ago, established the climate security mechanism, which um, essentially is, is a, an institutional home for this issue of climate security, which was um, a nomadic and therefore was falling between the cracks within the UN system between, you know, it wasn't the responsibility of any one single agency. And now there is this um, mechanism, which um, is the kind of the clearinghouse, the, the, the filter uh, and the, the part of the UN system that is responsible for ensuring that this issue is 
um, cross-fertilized and, and then disseminated to all the relevant agencies that need to be um, acting on this. So I think, I think this, there is some real practical value and, and this, of this, these multilateral initiatives, which then need to be kind of, need to filter down into the, the very practical operational steps at a more localized level. Thank you. Brian, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Um, you know, coming from Boeing in, in the private sector, it seems like this is really where the rubber meets the road in, in terms of ensuring that the climate and, and you know, reducing emissions is, is something that organizations are, are thinking about and taking into consideration when making their plans, especially for a global company. So how is it that, that, that Boeing is thinking about, um, you know, working with the defense sector to reducing global global gas emissions from 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 where you're sitting what does that look like yeah hey thanks rachel and uh, also thanks to globesec uh, for for having us on this panel um it's an honor to be here um look we have a vital role to play in, in decarbonizing aerospace and uh, we're hard at work in doing so so at boeing we want to be a trusted partner and we want to be transparent and in, in bringing innovative solutions to our uh, customers, and that's on the commercial side as well as on the defense side. Uh, I think the good news is that operational effectiveness and sustainability support each other. They're, they're really two sides of the same coin. And, you know, I think as Kate and Janani said, there's some real momentum right now. On the commercial side, if you look at all the declaration to, to hit net zero by the middle of the century, and even coming out of NATO this week, um, I think as Kate said, um, there's, there's a lot of forward progress, and it, it'll always be a team sport between industry and, and government. Uh, real quickly, how we look at, at decarbonizing airspace, it really falls into four buckets, and I, I'd love to elaborate later on how that might be relevant for the, for the military. But it's, first, it's fleet renewal, right? Taking less efficient products and airplanes out of the fleets and re replacing them with more efficient airplanes. Makes sense. Four engines to two engines. On the operations side, it's the second pillar, um, using digital tools, using analytics to fly more efficiently, to operate more efficiently, whether it's in the air or on the ground. And then thirdly, renewable energy. And I think that is perhaps, even though we always say there's no silver bullet, but if you're looking for one, it may be sustainable aviation fuels or sustainable fuels. Um, we have a long legacy in, in pioneering that space. First commercial flight in 2008 on the 747, we flew an F-18 um, uh, Super Hornet with, uh, with the United States Navy, uh, which we called the Green Hornet on, on SAF. C-17, which is uh, present in, uh, in, in um, NATO and Papa Hungary, also flew on, on SAF. So it's, it's technically uh, viable, it's ready, but it needs to be commercially uh, scaled. And then finally, the fourth pillar of how we are decarbonizing aerospace is new technology, whether that's through autonomous systems, lighter materials, uh, more digital design. So we have many levers at our disposal, but transferring some of those now to some of our military partners is a, an exciting opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, I like to broaden the aperture a little bit, and I'm going to ask Kate and Alexander both both to uh, address this question. If you look at the meetings that have taken place over the last week with NATO, US, EU, the G7, um, I'm thinking specifically about NATO's new strategic concept, which will involve uh, China and Russia heavily. They also have to be partners in in the the fight against uh, climate change and, and the climate crisis. So, how do you have you know these these two strategic competitors in Russia and China on so many other things um, play a role uh, that helps us go forward in in a way that um, you know c com combats uh, climate change. Kate, I'll ask yeah. you for that, and then Alexander, I'll come back to you. Yeah, look, it's a question of how do you compete and cooperate at the same time, and I can tell you it is the question in, in the debate halls of D.C. right now, especially when it comes to climate, especially when it comes to China. Um, how I see it, and I sort of work on uh, uh, climate as a geopolitical issue and, and the winners and losers and, and all of those questions, I think increasingly we are entering a, a moment of, of great power competition. Um, uh, you see this uh, in the Pacific, in the Arctic. What I hope for is that climate change and action on, on both reducing emissions, but also hopefully action on the security concepts of climate change are just so important and of such mutual interest to countries um, that the, the great powers can cooperate on these issues. And I see that uh, very starkly between the US and China and, and Russia specifically 
all three of these countries are facing immense impacts, offense, uh, immense destabilization at home, um, in their neighborhoods because of, of climate change. And not just in the long term, right? This is the next few decades. We'll see uh, dramatic impacts in those regions that all countries, uh, especially superpower countries, will have to deal with. So it is in their mutual interest to make sure that we're bending that curve of emissions and we're also building resilience in areas to, to prevent some of the worst uh, security outcomes. So to me, it's an issue where, yes, we might be heavily competing, uh, I, I speak as an, uh, an American, with our adversaries on many other issues, trade and, and security and, and the rest, climate can potentially be one of those touchstone areas where we can come together, still come to the table and speak in mutual interests. You saw this uh, during the Cold War, right? You had bitter adversaries um, of the US and USSR still working together on issues like nuclear nonproliferation and having those spaces where you can build trust, where you can uh, uh, have scientific cooperation, all the rest, can actually be a really important thing for uh, what is otherwise an increasingly competitive moment. Thank you. Alexander, I'd like to turn to you, if you could respond to that as well. Yes, I very much agree with uh, what Kate was just saying. Uh, we're all in this together. It's, uh, we've, we've won uh, tiny planets. You fly around it in, in, what is it, in two days you can fly around the planet. We're all stuck here in, in, in space. And we have to deal with this very same problem. Uh, China will be an essential partner, I think that's the right word, in, in solving uh, the, the climate crisis. And, and, and by the way, we have quite a few other planetary crises as well in, 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 in pollution and loss of nature, etc. China produces, I believe, 28% uh, of, um, of, of the CO2 emissions in the world, which is more than all the... Uh, the, 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 the classical developed uh, nations together produce. So we need China on board. Uh, I think China did a huge step, what was it, about a year ago when they said uh, that uh, they would uh, become, uh, they, they would uh, reach uh, net zero by, by 2060. Uh, after that, of course, everybody has been pushing for become a bit more concrete. They've come forward a little bit. They are on track, of course, not fast enough, but that's the same that you can say for, for the developed world and the, and the G7 countries. Um, historically, uh, we were the first ones that started polluting. Uh, a country like the United States is in, in absolute terms of all the greenhouse gases that they have produced since uh, the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the US is, is still the winner, so that also gives a responsibility. We have the means to adapt and we have the uh, we carry the guilt of, of having produced so much greenhouse gases that, that we should do so. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at this moment uh, in, 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 in the dire situation we're in, of course we have to look at China that is, uh, that is producing uh, so much. So we need to work together. Um, think of examples like, for instance, India and Pakistan. Since the Second World War, they fought three wars. But in the meantime, they have always kept uh, cooperating on transboundary rivers. Uh, there's like six main rivers that, that go from one country to the other. And they have been working and cooperating on transboundary waters even while they were um, at war. So, um, and I also like the, the comparison that Kate just made with um, our relationship with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So we need to to put climate change and all these planetary change issues that we're talking about in uh, in an area where we can keep talking and keep working together. And as a last comment here, it's not only the threats which are huge for a country like China, it's one meter sea level rise is a third of Shanghai underwater. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunities, especially for China, because the, the renewable uh, energy that we want to produce, we need um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the precious resources that, uh, that, uh, that, that China has. So there's an opportunity for them as well. And, and by the way, everything we consume is nowadays producing in China. So there's a competition, but there's also a lot of dependencies. Uh, so it, it asks for really, really skilled diplomacy on all sides. Thank you. John Annie, I'd like to bring it to you um, before we get to before we get to Slido. Um, climate migration is increasingly a, a an issue 
but um, will affect the national security for, for many countries, not just in, in Europe, but, but the United States as well. So how does climate migration play into this to this broader question? Is that something that you're looking at? I mean, how do we have these conversations in a way that I think centers humanitarianism, but at the, at, at the same time requires cooperation between, between many countries at once? Uh, thanks, Rachel. So I think the first thing I'd like to stress is that when oh, the, the, the term climate migration is somewhat problematic because there's never a single reason that people move. Um, it, it's always a, a complex mix of factors and uh, climate might be part of it, but um, it may not be the driver. A lot of people are displaced, absolutely, are displaced by sudden shocks like um, intense storms or slow onset climate impacts like you know, ongoing droughts over multiple years. Um, but this idea of um, of the increased number of people that are having to move, be it because they're, they're displaced or they it's feeding in, these climate stresses are feeding into their broader decisions to, to migrate. Um, it is part of the security, the kind of human security uh, risk landscape that we're, we're looking at. Uh, linked to climate change, but it's not the whole. Um, so I'd just like to speak about that in in a bit. But when it comes to um, climate mobility or cl the, the climate related mobility or, or migration, it's um, it's a it's a narrative which is very it can it, it's 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 got to be handled really sensitively. If you look at the numbers, if you really look at people on the move, most people are moving. A lot of people are moving, and most people are moving within countries. So there really isn't the evidence that um, that the, the media might lead us to believe of kind of hordes of migrants moving because of climate change from the Sahel <clears throat> into Southern Europe and then into, into Northern Europe or from um, Central America into, into North America. Uh, what we mainly see is stressed communities whose livelihoods are, are becoming less and less viable in the face of, of climate change, making decisions to maybe move from rural communities to the urban centers within the same country or just cross the border within the same region. So you see um, the, the exponential growth of um, second cities or um, or the capitals, which just don't have in, in already fragile context, which just don't have the governance structures and the infrastructure um, and the social safety nets to to absorb the these um, these incomers. So that is um, for me the the climate related uh, migration risk that we need to be really focusing on, because as there are these um, ill governed urban uh, centers growing in places like uh, Nigeria or Pakistan, um, there is much more likelihood of instability and, and conflict in these contexts than there are, there is um, with this kind of transboundary kind of Africa into Europe, uh, Latin America, Central America into uh, the US um, discourse. But as I mentioned, I think the climate uh, related migration piece is only part of the broader uh, landscape of risks which climate change is presenting um, to human security. Um, you might have heard climate described as a threat multiplier or a crisis multiplier is I think how Jens Stoltenberg described it at the NATO summit um, earlier in the week. But what does this actually mean? It's not just about kind of um, migration and people having to move and the, the risks um, and potential conflict risks linked to this. It's It means that climate change through a range of impacts from these kind of hydrometeorological um, direct impacts like droughts, floods, more intense storms, um, having this kind of knock-on consequence on, on human um, well-being uh, and affecting economic development and, and reversing development gains and reversing peace gains. Um, and these risks, these these risk pathways are, are incredibly complex and they're incredibly context dependent, but they tend to always be grounded in specific mm -hmm. social, political and economic dynamics, things particularly relating to livelihood stresses and pre-existing inequalities and different differential access to uh, power and access to natural resources. So when it comes to thinking about what to do about this, I think it, it has to go beyond thinking about, oh, 
how many people are moving and how do we stop them. It's about understanding um, why why people are more vulnerable to these climate security risks. It's because they are already marginalized. They're from a particular ethno-religious group or they, they, they are women or children or disabled who have um, already got constraints on their access to natural resources, which climate change is um, magnifying or amplifying, or they have livelihoods that are dependent on uh, natural resources and rainfall, which are becoming less and less viable in the face of greater climate variability. Um, so I think it's important to see all the different pathways that play out in the different contexts and certainly climate related uh, mobility, displacement and migration is a piece of this, but there are many, many of these pathways. Thank you so much. And and Brian, I wanted I wanted to come to you and build on something that Janani said. Janani, you mentioned human security a few times uh, in 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 your in your comments, and I think the paradox when it comes to to human security is that for a lot of countries, this this includes you know deployment operations and stability operations, which then leave carbon footprints. And and so I'm wondering, Brian, you know, when you think about how industry uh, and military come together to reduce the carbon footprint of of major deployment operations, how how are you thinking about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, cooperation with, with military is in our DNA. They're our customers, so it's our first job to listen to their requirements and to bring innovative solutions. But um, as it relates to climate, I think Alexander calls this one's a faceless enemy, so we're going to fight that enemy together. And, and industry and military have long partnered. I, I'm thinking, since it's NATO week, among others, I'm thinking of um, our NATO AWACS program, where 60 nations have come together and what uh, NATO has called one of the most successful collaborative um, adventures ever undertaken by the Alliance. Pooling, sharing, partnering with uh, across militaries and with industry is, uh, is a well-proven concept that, that works well. You know, the Secretary General said earlier this week that he wants NATO and, and the forces in general to be more capable, more digital, and more green. And if you think about each of these buckets, um, on the capability side, at Boeing, and again, it's, it's, it's what we do. We've invested $60 billion of our own money over the last decade in innovative technologies and capabilities, many of which uh, directly to reduce uh, our um, you know, environmental footprint and, and advance sort of the environmental progressive aspects of our products. On the digital side, again, as I said earlier, there are a lot of tools and capabilities that we're putting in the hands of our customers that allow them to operate more efficiently, whether that's, again, in the air or on the ground. In the air, we have uh, digital um, tools that allow flights to be more direct, uh, to anticipate weather. Um, so so every, every ounce of, of fuel burn matters. And so these digital tools and the analytics behind it um, are really important. And then his point of being more green, I want to get back to it. I think um, renewable energy, whether that's on the ground, and there have been many sort of smart, uh, smart defense initiatives at NATO that have, have uh, piloted that, or in the air with sustainable aviation fuels, which are 50 to 80 percent lower CO2, um, I think are, are, are perfect examples of where we can partner to further bend the curve and, uh, and achieve net zero, which NATO, as, as Kate said earlier, has set out to, to achieve by the middle of the, um, um, this century. Thank you. So we have a, a little over 15 minutes left. So I want to go ahead and turn to audience questions. I'll start with Slido. But again, if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask live, just feel free to raise your hand. I'll find you and you can um, walk up to the to the microphone and, and ask it yourself. There's a really good question from um, Matthias Slovaki uh, from, from Moody's who, who mentioned uh, how how is the EU going to be able to find balance between going green and ensuring production being competitive in the global economy? So, Alexander, I'd like to come to you for that question. Uh, yeah, I think the the EU is is uh, is rapidly advancing in. Um, oh, sorry, I have to look at screen now. Would I lost it? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Will the EU oh, be able to, they got it, um, okay. <laughs> balance between going green and ensuring production being competitive. Yes, well, uh, the global economy is going to be uh, green. I mean, that is the future. And uh, so um, in in lagging behind now for, for those countries that believe that you can continue with 
you know, using coal or, or having a fossil uh, fuel based economy, um, it, it might help you for a little bit in a short while. But ultimately, you have to follow the new trends in technology. It's, 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 it's one of the uh, one of the few uh, things you can you can you can learn from history. And uh, also think about what what Brian was just saying about uh, how Boeing is innovating and also in its cooperation with the military. Um, the military have always been on top of new trends. And for a long time, those trends were going into the direction of more fossil fuels. There used to be sailing ships with cannons and Spanish galleons, whatever. And someday we moved into steamships and, and, and into, uh, into new technology of, of using oil and ultimately even uh, nuclear for, for some Navy ships. Uh, but now the new trend is going towards green and you can't imagine that uh, the military stays behind there. So I think for uh, the EU is now rapidly uh, becoming more involved on a path uh, towards, towards becoming green. The, the quite recently, the ambitions have been, been really increased from um, uh, from from uh, forty to to uh, to fifty five percent just 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 recently, uh, and I think that is um, that is the new trend where where you will find the winners, not just in, in Europe, but, but worldwide. Thanks. Brian, did you want to add to that? I see you nod or, nodding vigorously. <laughs> no, I, 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 sorry, I'm, <laughs> it's engaging. Alexander, is, is, I think is spot on. And, and um, just a couple of examples come to mind. Uh, one being, uh, again, I, I come back to fuels because there, that, that is the carbon we're talking about. And sustainable aviation fuels and the, and the signal the MODs uh, could send or are sending in some cases um, are, are essential because right now we're, we can't close or we haven't closed the price gap. We, we, can, we can produce it. We know how to do it. And we've flown it all the way up to 100%. Boeing flew a 777 in 2018 on 100% SAF. Um, the problem is that the price point is 2 to 3x. And so I think a demand signal from the MODs, as it's already happening, I saw in the, in the, uh, the UK Ministry of Defense has, has suggested that 50% of their, uh, their fleet will fly on 50% SAF in the near future. Uh, those are really important signals to the market, to the producers to go produce this stuff. So, um, and I, I come back to a final point, this, this notion that there are really side, two sides of the same coin. This notion that a, a greener, more sustainable uh, force is somehow less capable or somehow less competitive, I think it is false. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a couple questions here, and I'm going to turn both to Kate and Johnani to, to answer them. The first one, I'm going to admit ignorance because uh, you guys are, are, are better uh, uh, suited to, to answer these climate questions than I, but there's a really good question from Lucia that says, is geoengineering a plausible solution that we can possibly turn to to mitigate climate change? So I'll ask that one. But then also, there's another great question on what are the biggest issues arising from uh, from climate change for the defense sector specifically? So Kate, I'll turn to you and then John and I'll come to you afterwards. Sure, all the easy ones. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> with geoengineering, so I personally, I mean, there's a lot more research that, that needs to be done into these technologies because the, the biggest thing is there are so many question marks still about how throwing chemicals into the ocean or into the atmosphere have dramatic knock-on effects that we just don't understand yet, that science hasn't hasn't really gotten its its uh, arms around. So, uh, you know, that's, that's not a viable option for now unless we want to potentially uh, uh, cause strange triggers in the climate system that we don't know about. What I am worried about when it comes to geoengineering is the massive security threat behind it. Um, that, you know, regardless of what it, it devastation they could do to our ecosystems, um, just think about the, the nature of uh, potential blame behind some of those events. So the, the example here is, say there was a, a huge hurricane that we knew was going to strike um, uh, Norfolk, our, our biggest naval base in the United States, um, and we potentially had the power uh, to do something about that, which again is, is under doubt. Uh, would we be able to say, yes, well, we're going to do this and, and change the path of this hurricane if it had knock-on effects down the road that we didn't understand and we didn't know. And the security 
problem there is as soon as that genie is out of the bottle, you can always blame, well, the United States did that, right? The United States uh, was involved in that, that, that led to the drought that we had in Mexico months later. We don't know that that's the case, um, but a country can always sort of change and, and point the finger and have that blame, right? And we see this already, um, unfortunately, with climate uh, effects in places in the Middle East and in Africa, groups on the ground are taking advantage of that climate change for their security, um, their security consequences, right? So uh, there's great reporting out of Iraq where ISIS has used climate change as a recruitment tool for its ranks, right? Saying, look at what's happening. That's the West. Uh, they're to blame for this. Come and join us um, and, and we'll fight back, back against the people that caused drought in your home. Geoengineering to me is that same sort of of blame game where it can be a tool of, of ethno-nationalism and a tool of uh, sort of increasing tensions between countries. Um, that to me is uh, one of the biggest impacts for the defense sector. I mean, you can look at it across three different metrics, the, the impacts on security environments, the impacts on security infrastructure, and the impacts on our security institutions as well, right? So you'll have those direct and, and second and third order consequences on the environment that you're operating in. You'll have increasingly uh, devastating impacts on your infrastructure. Think about permafrost thaw in the Arctic and, and the devastating sort of uh, melting that that does to often nuclear installations in that region. But also our institutions, right? Can NATO withstand the intense, more intense, more frequent shocks that are going to be happening in its region of the world? Are our institutions strong enough to sort of stick together and cooperate as we talked about in that reality? I think that's an open question. Um, are our alliances, are our global institutions, the UN Security Council, are these bodies fit for purpose to deal with these coming trends and these coming threats? Um, to me, that's maybe the, the most worrying aspect of, of defense implications. Thank you. John and I, I'm gonna to turn to you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, um, I think I, I share Kate's uh, concerns and fears about geoengineering. I, I, I think, however, whatever we feel kind of morally and ethically about the risks and the uncertainties um, that it holds, it is going ahead because there's no control either within um, in the private sector. There is a lot of um, R and D around this. There's a lot of investment, um, and also in in kind of non-aligned countries who might just be advancing this, and even in in within the ally uh, uh, allies, um, NATO allies are also advancing s some um, um, avenues of of research into this. But I think the really critical thing is accepting that it is is happening and it is going to happen, and that there then needs to be. Um, some form of global governance in this. It, it, it needs to be regulated because we can't stop it. We can't stop it. We can, we can hope that it's not going to advance too much, but um, pragmatically, this does need, geoengineering does need to have some regulations within some kind of a global governance framework. Do we have the multilateral institution ready um, in place? Do we have the international legal frameworks in place? No. Um, so I think this is something that we really need to be thinking about. I mean, there are efforts around this. Um, the Carnegie Foundation is doing some great work here. Um, and I think um, it, it, I think this global governance framework for geoengineering is, is critical just to, you know, ensure that when it does happen and whatever forms it, it's taking, there are some um, rules and some restitution measures for the kind of the blame and the, the consequences that Kate touched on um, in her response. And in terms of the the challenge for uh, for the, the defense community, I think the, the tripartite kind of uh, system that Kate set out uh, is, is a really helpful way of thinking about this, how the the defense communities got to be ready. And I think there's a lot of um, thinking going into mission readiness. There's, a, a, and you know, changing the way that um, military assets are, are being uh, planned for the future. Um, there's also thinking around kind of um, the challenges around um, needing to do more kind of disaster response, uh, more civilian protection work in places like the Pacific and places that we know are already um, facing much more intense and frequent climate impacts and then the, the 
security communities having to step up as first responders. Where I think there is a gap is uh, that the security sector needs to be better able to also deal with these, these new uh, climate security risks that are being created or the climate security um, implications which are co compounding existing conflicts. Uh, Kate mentioned Iraq, that's a great example. Another example is the Lake Chad region of, um, of the Sahel, where you look at existing military operations uh, and you see that they are entirely climate blind and they're actually doing more harm. And we've got some really compelling evidence. I was um, lucky enough to be uh, able to do some field work there when we heard from members of armed groups and um, kind of ex-members of armed groups like Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa saying that the reason that they joined wasn't to do with any ideological um, affil affinity. It was because of the security strategies um, of international um, stabilization efforts and counter-terror efforts that were undermining their livelihoods. So kind of um, international troops coming in with things like slash and burn strategies to literally smoke out insurgents, um, but then by doing so degrading already drought affected arid land and soil that are what the, the, this very agrarian community needs to sustain its livelihood. These kind of operations, these strategies uh, were then really locking people into this kind of climate security cycle um, of, of conflict because there was just no way out then if your livelihood's been eroded now for the next decade, they had no choice but to join armed groups. Um, and also we're just so angry at, at such um, such blindness. So I think this, there's a real need to climate proof security strategies and stabilization strategies and peacekeeping. And I think that's a real knowledge gap that needs to be um, filled by the security community. Thank you. Okay, so we have about four minutes left. So I'm going to go around the horn and everyone has a, a, about a minute. We have talked about when it comes to climate and, and the intersection uh, of climate and security, we've talked about multinational institutions, the private sector, um, global partnerships. What did we miss? What is it that the audience should know? What should we be thinking about that we didn't discuss today? Uh, Alexander, Brian, Janani, and then I'll close with Kate. Alexander, to you. I think the key message should be that uh, we can solve climate change. We know how to do it. We have the knowledge, we have the technology, we even have the money. It is less expensive to do it now than to wait. And we know exactly how to do it. And a huge part of that is following everything that we have promised to each other to do in, in 2015 in, in the Agenda 2030. And we can do it. The only thing that is lacking is leadership and political will and good international cooperation. I'm hopeful for this year that after four dreadful years where the biggest leader in the world was not leading and only creating devastating policies, that now that the U.S. is back in the game and is leading, that we have a chance. Because if the U.S. is not there, nothing happens. If the U.S. is there, something can happen. Uh, but is it is it enough that we see? No, it isn't. Uh, leading up to COP26, it is so important that this year becomes something like the second half of 2015, where there's hope, where we set the right policies, and where we go forward, because it is doable. That's my one minute, I hope. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, look, I thought it was a really good discussion. Um, the one thing that jumps to mind is, is target setting. Um, I think the Secretary General talked about um, sort of realistic, ambitious, and, and, and concrete targets. You know, at Boeing, we, we hit net zero for our own operations inside of our four walls last year. And um, you can do that when you know what you're netting against. And um, so I think um, whether it's with the US administration or, or indeed uh, at NATO, um, setting some targets out and then being able to measure against those is an important um, opportunity and where industry can help in that we've been on a journey for some time in, in burning down um, and decarbonizing our operations and our, and, our, and our footprint. So I think that would be one point. Thank you. Janani, over to you. you got about 30 seconds, <laughs> and then I'll close with Kate. Oh, goodness. OK. Um, well, I think a lot of the conversation we've had, it focuses on mitigation, on reducing emissions. I think we also need to give equal space to adaptation, the need to adapt to the climate risks already at play. I think oftentimes people get fixated on technical responses to these climate risks. Um, and I'd say a, a real priority uh, within the frame of this kind of need to look at also at adaptation is um, 
looking at what drives climate security risks. Um, and so programming responses need to focus also on things, these kind of soft and maybe, you know, I'm very aware of being the, uh, the civil society voice in this uh, security uh, conference, but um, people-centered issues, things like bolstering social cohesion, building trust between state and people and redressing inequalities. Now, these aren't kind of big um, military uh, approaches, but I think these, these are the factors that underlie vulnerability, the marginalization of women and group, uh, youth for example and this is what makes them vulnerable to climate and conflict risks and so this also needs to be part of what we're thinking about in terms of future engagement thank you okay if i could take us home yeah well underscore all of all of what was just said from each angle i mean the way i see this is this is now a central defense and security issue it's not a side environment issue anymore. This is the stuff of strategic competition of the future between all of our nations. So it's not something that, that we can just uh, forget about or, or keep to the environment ministries anymore. It's stuff that our defense ministries need to understand. The problem is, is we often don't have the talent in our MODs, in our uh, senior um, political uh, dip diplomats to understand these problems. So I, I guess I challenge all of you to to think really seriously about the the training and education that needs to happen in, in your security sectors to understand these problems. You know, climate change is a, a messy, complicated issue. It involves a lot of science. It involves a lot of modeling. Are your uh, uh, forces understanding what to do in those situations? Do they know sort of how to climate proof their operations, how to build resilience? Um, it's going to take investment and it's going to take retraining. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, so our, our World Climate Insecurity Report came out last week uh, for the NATO summit and, and offer solutions of these types. You know, how should Ministry of Defense be planning and strategizing around these issues? So you can go look that up, uh, the World Climate and Security Report 2021, for a first taste of, of what you should be doing and how you should be restructuring your security operations. Perfect. Well, that was a wonderful note to end on. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we're going to continue in this room at 2.20 with a session on political extremism goes virtual and international. But right now, uh, we'll be streaming Maria Theresia stage with a Globesec talk from Radislav Danilak and a session uh, growing the digital economy in CEE with ministers from Slovakia, Estonia, and Slovenia. So thank you, Globesec. Thank you to our panelists. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you.